Restaurant Unstoppable, episode 727 with John Hoteling. With excitement, allow me to introduce you today's guest, John Hoteling. John, my man, are you feeling unstoppable today? I'm feeling pretty good. Dude, I'm feeling good. I'm really excited to spread the work or to spread the word about the work you're doing right now. I think it's it's amazing work and uh, I can't wait to get the word out there. So Well, I appreciate I appreciate the forum because this is this is real important. Yeah, absolutely. Let me give the, the listeners an idea of who we're talking to. So John Hoteling is the owner at Goche Murphy and Hoteling LLC attorneys at law where they specialize in first party business insurance litigation. He is also leading the business interruption group, a nonprofit advocacy group uh, comprised of leaders in the industry, including Wolfgang Puck, Daniel Balud, and Thomas Keller. Today, we're here to tell the truth behind what insurers are doing to restaurant owners. And hopefully from there, from a legal standpoint, we'll discuss uh, what is important for restaurant tours and know relative to the pandemic COVID-19. Maybe you can get some advice from, from you. Uh, but before we dive into the story that you're going to share with us today, why don't we get that motivational, inspirational ball rolling with a success quote or mantra. What do you got for us? A uh, success quote or mantra. Actually, I've got what well, we're sitting here next to my desk. So I got one on my desk. Yeah, that, grab it. That, that this is, this is one I've got engraved. Um, this was something my father, my father always repeated to me. Um, when I took over the law firm, it was on the desk of Wendell Goche, who, for those in the legal field, he's a legal giant. He's the guy who took down big tobacco okay. from my law firm. So he had this on his desk too. So I had it's here. It says, it's a, it's a quote from Colin Coolidge. It says, uh, "Press on. Nothing in the world can take the pa- the place of persistence. Talent will not." Nothing is more common than unsuccessful men with talent. Genius will not. Unrewarded genius is almost a proverb. Education will not. The world is full of educated delerics. Persistence and determination are alone omnipotent. Mm. So it's basically, you know what? You don't give up. You press on, you know, and, and that's what I think, you know, it makes a difference between you know, people have got, they see things that are wrong, right? We see things that are wrong all the time, and sometimes we let it go by or we give up or we, you know, don't do that one thing. And what makes a difference if things happen or not are, you know, getting up off the canvas yeah. and keep going. And you've made a career out of tackling giants and going after giants and getting justice for, uh, on behalf of people who are, you know, victims of some of these giants. How do you find that persistence, that persistence when you're going against these people that have what seems like unlimited resources? Yeah. Is, is there a, a words of advice or a trick that you, you implement to find the persistence within you? I think you got to visionize it, right? You got to, you got to, you visualize it. I, I, um, I saw Goche and you know, I saw my mentor do it. You know, he took on, I mean, the biggest, baddest industry that ever existed in in capitalism. If you look at it and you think, uh, okay, there's slavery, right? So that was a terrible, horrible thing. Um, you've but you but you've got from an economic standpoint, tobacco would just did terrible things, and they lied and they did different stuff. And uh, and he took on tobacco, big tobacco. He got mm. a bunch of people together, um, and he went after him, and you know, it landed the largest civil litigation, you know, thing and hit was $286 billion. And he landed that as interesting when I took on this fight that we're going to talk about. When I filed it, I filed the first COVID-19 lawsuit. I brought all the people from the law firm together. And I said, remember when Wendell filed that lawsuit? Many of them were still there. I said, we're about to file the most important piece of litigation in civil history mm. and, the, and and this is going to be a giant this is going to be this is going to pale tobacco will compel in comparison to what to what the stake here and so it's just you know i saw him take on giants and win yeah. climb that mountain and i think often in life we we don't visualize it and go after it and say uh, i'm I can do it. I'm going to do it. And the odds, you know, there's long odds. You got to be smart about it. But, you know, if you're persistent in the things I've seen, it, I've seen it happen. Yeah. And I think uh, it seems like it's a common theme. A lot of the, the, the people you've partnered with in the past, we're talking about uh, Goche and th- these people, when they, they're tackling social issues and there seems to be a mission behind the cases, right? And it's not just we're going after this case, but it seems like a lot of the cases you take on are mission driven or purpose driven and just having mission and purpose in itself must be a great source of, you know, inspiration to 
persists too. You have a reason, right? You're not just yeah. trying to collect a check. Like there's, you're making social difference, and it seems like in a lot of your work. And I mean, does that play into it? I'm, it mu- I feel like it must. Yeah, it does. I mean, you know, look, people are people are fundamentally we're animals. We're we're selfish, right? Yeah. So so you've got to have. Whenever I hear someone that says, I'm doing it, I'm not doing it for the money, I'm not doing it at all, I'm doing it for other, you know, you got to kind of look behind it. There are people that do that, but most people are motivations to feed their families, right? But it, there is a beautiful thing when you can align your own self-interest with the interest of a greater good. Mm-hmm. Like, if you can align those two things, it can be great. And, and that is part of, when we think about how capitalism works... It is aligning what what society needs with what I want, you know. And when you can align those two things, when you can find, when you can align your self interest with what is needed, then things can happen. When those two things go awry, either people are doing something bad or they're not doing something successful. Yes, great way to get this thing started. Thank you for going into that. And before we dive into the story around COVID-19 and what these insurers were doing to restaurant owners, why don't you just give a, I mean, I feel like we've already got a sense of who you are through the introduction, but just give the, the listeners an idea of who you are, kind of round off that image of what the work you do before we dive into how this all unfolded. Well, um, well, I took over. I took over the Goche firm, um, um, I, which was a famous law firm, and I took it over about six months before Katrina happened. And because we're here in New Orleans, we all that that big tobacco suit and everything was launched from New Orleans. And I took the firm over. Uh, had a lot of responsibility. Um, only had about six months or something to you know feel good about. I I I, I grew up very. I grew up. I didn't grow up in a house like this or uh, or or success stuff. My my father made thirty nine dollars the year I was born, so I grew up very very poor, and I had climbed this what it appeared to be the top of the mountain to get to head of this famous law firm. I had moved boxes to to get a job to sneak my way into the firm, and here I was running it. But I had six months to feel good about it, and then Katrina hadn't wiped us out. Oh my gosh! And it didn't just, of course, it didn't just wiped us out. Yeah, it, it wiped out an American city, mm-hmm. right? And and it didn't wipe out an American city for a week or a month. It decimated it, right? I mean, completely, you couldn't get into the city for, th- for three months. Right. It was bad. And what I saw was people, everybody that I knew, devastated. But we had all, you know, most of us, um, we had attained, you know, we had our businesses or our homes or our things, and we paid insurance, right? I mean... That's what you do in America. You know, that's how the economy works. You, if you buy something, you invest in something. You, sometimes you can't you can't buy it without insurance, right? The law requires it, or the mortgage requires it. So most people in New Orleans had insurance. I had insurance. Everybody I knew, all my employees had insurance in their homes. And so after the shock of it, of a big disaster like this, and it's happening now, um, you think, okay. Um, I can, I can do this. I'm all right. You know, I can pick myself up. Yeah, my kid's bedroom's destroyed. My business is destroyed. Things are done. But you know what? I'll survive. I, I prepared for this, right? Mm-hmm. I, I've taken some of every little bit and I put it away, paid it to a company to protect me, right? There's a there's a lifeboat here. Yeah, the ship's sinking, but there's a lifeboat. I can get on it, you right? You think so. You think so. <laughs> yeah. And then what happens is it's sinking and then it they don't drop the boats. And that's what happened in New Orleans. And so... The Attorney General, um, uh, uh, I, I got in contact with the Attorney General of Louisiana at the time, and we started seeing the insurance companies just walking away, mm. walking away uh, from people's lives. And and they were doing it in ways that were wrong. They were wrongfully denying the claims. And so the Attorney General hired me to police the insur- the conduct of the insurance companies. And... Uh, and and then and and we've caught the insurance companies doing things, literally forging documents to deny policyholders, to deny people. Um, and I saw people devastated. It, it's not just losing everything, because when you lose everything, you go, okay, well, I'll pick myself up. But when you lose something, and then you get slapped with an injustice, like wait a second, I did the right thing here. Yeah, the, the security that you have in your insurance, the one thing you're hanging on to, right. you're like, okay, like we have insurance. Like, right. It's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. And then that, that gets pulled out from underneath you. I mean, yeah. You must just feel like you're free falling. Like, yeah. With like no hope. And it's worse than, it's worse than, than having your hopes dashed. Yeah. Because 
there's a feeling of injustice with it. It's like, wait a second. For decades, I haven't been buying that new thing. I haven't been doing that thing. I haven't spending every, I've been paying it to you doing the right to protect thing. me. Yeah. And, and you, you promised me that you'd be on my side. You promised me that I'd be in good hands. You know, that you promised me when this would happen, you'd be my good neighbor. Yeah. And, and guess what? You, where are you? You're gone. Mm -hmm. And there's a feeling of, of, of desperation. Now, what happens in these situations, what happened back then, same thing that's happening now, is the insurance companies, see, they're smart, right? They're not just smart, though. They have all our money, right? So right now, the insurance industry is sitting on $822 billion of our cash, yeah. And they get to do what they want with that money. And instead of paying it, what's happened with insurance over the last many decades is it's become a war chest that they now have. And they're, your insurance companies, what you find out, they're not, they're, they're, they're not on your side. They can't be on your side. Why? Because they have your money and you're asking for it. They're, they're adverse to you. So they take that money. They took it in Katrina. That's what they're doing now. They take that money and they hire lobbyists instead of paying people. They're using your money to defend themselves. Yes, they're yeah. using their money to to prevent your money from going back to you. Okay, <laughs> it's and so that, that slimy. It's, it, but that's what happens. Yeah, but it's not the you know you got to look past what the advertising is. and and all of your money, part of your policy premiums pays defense lawyers and lobbyists. It doesn't pay people on your side, mm -hmm. right? So so. What happened in Katrina was terrible, but we disclosed a lot of bad stuff, and we rebuilt the city. And I then went on the road to talk about what the companies would happen, and I'd go to another disaster area, and the same thing well, insane, would happen. Right? It was yeah, it was many, many. It was after hurricanes or different things. I went to one after that, and then I mean the last major one where if you take it and you say let's take a whole area that was decimated was Superstorm Sandy. Right, the tri-state area was decimated, and um, the insurers did the same thing. And I heard the same stories. And what happens? The insurance companies run to Washington, and with their lobby, say, oh, "We don't. We, this isn't us. Don't look at us. Government, you pay. You bail these people out, right? Your government, you put a pot up, and they don't pay." And so I was, you know, I was pointed uh, the. It's called Colia Liaison Council for Plaintiffs. By the federal court, I, I filed most of the claims in Superstorm Sandy, at 80% of the original claims, and I fought that. And what was interesting in that, what's interesting now, nothing changed. Uh, and that was, uh, you know, nothing. I was very exasperated by Superstorm Sandy because I'd been doing it for over a decade of trying to expose the stuff and trying to make a difference. And um, I had made a lot of money for myself, you know. I had bought a jet and a fleet of Ferraris and, you know, lived in a mansion and beach houses, and I had, I had, I had wealth beyond my, mad, my dreams. And I had gotten things from my clients, but I didn't affect the industry. The industry didn't. It got worse, not better. And so the insurance industry. The insurance industry. Okay. It just, the insurance industry got worse in the claims handling and the denials. The company that handled claims started getting bigger you know, these big multi-billion dollar corporations that shield insurance companies now exist. And I saw it in, in Superstorm Sandy, I, fa I discovered that some of the same companies, not even just the same companies, the same people that forged documents in Katrina were forging documents for insurance companies to deny policyholders in Superstorm Sandy. And I did the same thing. I went to the attorney general and got them, and actually got a major insurance executive arrested in handcuffs. It went on 60 Minutes. And, and so we got over 144,000 property owners reopened. And then I thought, okay, finally, right? Like, like now there was a bunch of press on it. It was 60 Minutes, and Frontline did stories about what we had done, and we had Senate hearings about what the insurance companies were doing. I'm like, okay, finally, you know? Um, and in that battle... I invested personally um, tens of millions of dollars, more than thirty million dollars, into fighting it for my clients, um, and I and I ended up losing money, even though we we got hundreds of millions of dollars collected for for my clients uh, and and others. We we lost money. And I thought we'd we'd fix it, but I but we didn't. And when COVID nineteen happened, 
you know, it, it was when this was starting to come, like when we, I saw it in China, I got a business in, I'm an also an entrepreneur. I got a business in China and I start happening there and then it was coming to Italy uh, and I got friends in Italy. I was calling, speaking to, and you know, it's come to the U S and I'm saying to myself, I know what's going to happen. Like for me, it's like another big disaster. It's like Groundhog Day. Like I've seen this day before. I know they're not going to pay. Yeah. So yeah. you knew, like, back in February, you had a pretty good hunch that that you know you were you were poking a l- around a little to make sure because I, I listened to a couple of your previous interviews, so I know a little bit of the story. Yeah. Why don't you take it to that point? So we're back. Uh, we've learned that you spent you know, the majority of your career d- uh, defending against insurers. Uh, you, you're you're seeing after COVID nineteen, you have a hunch that w- these experiences experiences you've experienced in the past are going to come up again with insurers trying to get out of their responsibilities. And you say, wait a second, what's going on here? Take it from there. Yeah. So you know because I've I've kind of been. I don't know the center of the bullseye. I guess if you if you look at it from the insurer standpoint of all this stuff or the tip of the spear, you know I'm in a leadership role and usually of these big disasters, I get kind of info. You know, as you do yeah. on the other side, right before it happens, you try to you try to get some intelligence yeah. of what the other side's doing before they do it. Um, and I started to get reports that the insurance companies weren't going to pay. Uh, the business interruption claims, and you know, for for those that 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 have businesses, um, you know, and and this is it's worth going back and and looking at it. You know, if you're if you're a worker in America, chances are uh, your employer took some of its profit and paid an insurance company to protect your check, protect your paycheck in the event of a civil authority shutdown. So. Business businesses that have employ, lots of employees or many employees generally will have not all businesses have business interruption coverage, but many of them do as part of their pop, property policy. Mm-hmm. And in that insurance, you have insurance for a thing called civil authority coverage on every policy, every business policy. And what that says is the, your policy is insuring your business in case the government shuts you down. Okay. okay? So if a, if a dangerous thing happens and the government shutting you down because of a dangerous condition in an area, you have coverage. So all of my friends, you know, and I have a lot of friends. I'm not in the restaurant business, but I am very close to it because my best friends in the world have restaurants. And and I live in New Orleans, which is a restaurant town, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so they were all saying, you know, you know we're, we're going to be covered, right? We're, we're going to be okay. And I knew that they weren't going to pay. And so we got word. Now, in if you look at the history of business interruption policies and pandemics, right? There was the SARS pandemic. That's the one we can look yeah. to, right? The SARS pandemic happened in 2003, and, and civil authorities had to shut businesses down. Well, the insurance companies had to pay it. Yeah, right? and, and that was when they learned their lesson that they should probably get that fine print in there. Yeah, right. so after 2003, they went and said, well, we don't want to pay for this, right? So they slip in they slip in exclusions. And so some exclusions, in a very controversial manner, we can go back, it's another story, but a very controversial way, they slipped in some exclusions, but not, not in all the policies, okay. only in some. So I knew that many of the businesses... Uh, had, did not have exclusions. They had coverage for civil authority. Quite clear. Government shuts you down. It's a dangerous property condition in the area. You have coverage. So businesses would be covered. And then I got a white paper from the leading defense firm that went and said, it didn't say, you know, I'm, I'm expecting them to say, okay, some of the policies have it, some policies don't. And it said that. And then it said, but we're not going to, they're not going to pay the ones that don't have the exclusions. Mm. And like my, st- you know, I remember reading it. It was on March. It was on March 11th, right before things, days before they publicize this stuff, days before they shut things down. And my stomach drops because they say we're not going to pay it. And the reason they said it was was just outrageous. They said, "Well, there has to be a dangerous property condition during the shutdown, and there is not because the civil authority shutdowns are only about, about social distancing, not because there's a dangerous property condition." Social distancing, because if those people go into the property, it will become unsafe. Right. So it's kind of a 
Oh. Yeah, yeah, but you know, in property in property law though, like you have to have some type of physical damage or loss in order to cause the business interruption coverage. And so there's got to be some type of connection to you losing the use of your property. Okay. And and so what was clear though was that COVID-19 wasn't we're not getting it just because we're people are coughing on each other like before this interview you made the point to me to say we sterilize this microphone why because we know COVID-19 gets on stuff yeah right and it causes um a, it's dangerous and you can catch it by touching stuff stuff's contaminated and so I knew this and they said the the defense lawyers who wrote these white papers before the shutdowns they're preparing for this and they're saying well, the, COVID, the, the civil authorities aren't going to have anything to do with property damage. They're going to have to do with property loss. They got, they, it's, not, it's only for social distancing. I'm like, no, it's not. It's because it's getting on stuff. Yeah. So I read this, and then the next day, and this was a coincidence, um, Jerome Bocuse, a famous, you know, Paul Bocuse's son, famous chef, is one of my dearest. Uh, so I've got three buddies that are my dearest, dearest friends in the world. Like, like know them for a decade and a half. Is uh, is, is Jerome Bacuse, uh, uh Thomas Keller, and Danielle Blude. These are three like very, very dear, good friends, very, very dear buzzy yeah. buddies. <laughs> yeah, yeah, really, really good friends. Um, and and so Jerome was doing a culinary event in this house where we're doing this interview. Uh, on March 12th, and we were preparing for I mean, he had all his chefs here and everything. We had this big meal plan, and Jerome walked in the door that night, and he goes, they're going to shut my restaurant down tomorrow, Di- you know, because he has a restaurant in Disney. Okay. And he said, they're going to shut it down. And he goes, but I got coverage. You know, we checked. And I'm like, Jerome, man, sit down. You know, and I'm thinking, oh, shit, this is going to ruin the party. Sit down. <laughs> uh, yeah, I was like, this, this party's going to yeah. be bad, <laughs> you know. And so we sit down, I'm like, they're not going to pay it. He's like, what do you mean? He's like, I have no. I got. We checked it. We got coverage for if they shut us down. We got coverage. It says it's clear. I said they're gonna deny that it that it impacts property. So did he have the 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 insurance that included, or was there any the exempt? Yeah, there's no exclusion. Okay, there's no no exclusion. exclusion, right? He's like, I, we checked it. Yeah. Like we, and um, and and. And and uh, you know we, we we later got his policy. He's like, I think I've covered, and I later got his policy, confirmed it, and. So one, of, so one of so the thing I just want to make sure the policy he had didn't say anything about this policy excludes the viruses or pandemics. Yeah, so that wasn't included. Yeah, they, so, well, no. They, so there's this is this gets confusing, right? So policies are generally all risk policies. Okay. Okay. They say, look, unless it's excluded, that's the law. Unless it's excluded, it's included. Okay. okay? So and you had civil authority coverage. The only way it doesn't apply is if it's ex- clearly excluded. So if they exclude pandemics, right? Okay. They exclude. And they exclude pandemics after, sorry, on some policies. Jerome's, they did not. Okay. Okay? And so I had to break them the news that it didn't matter what his policy said. They okay. weren't going to pay anyway. And and he's, you know, and it's like the processing when you do this, and I've, I've, I've had to tell people bad news like that. It's like they're not going to pay you. Yeah. And then the first process, and we started talking, and it's like, oh, my God, you know, because it's like, okay, well, what next? And then your mind starts walking, well, that means I'm not going to be income, and that means I may shut down for a month. I may be shut down two months. I may be shut down three months. The rest of the year. I may shut down the rest of the year. And then, very quickly, we started talking. I'm like, it's not just you. It's Thomas. It's Danielle. They got restaurants all over. And these are... You know, people look at these guys and they look at them and think of their culinary gods and everything like they're untouchable, that they're in the clouds. But the reality is, you know, if you run and everyone that runs restaurants understands this, it's very, very, you know, labor intensive. It's very, very high, you know, expense, you know, your expenses and your overhead is really high. Your yeah. profits margins are thin, especially restaurants like these. I mean, they might have meat aging that alone is worth tens of thousands if not over you know, near a million dollars. some of these places have oh, like yeah. just shelves of aging beef yeah. right and there's value in that or just, or truffles or, or whatever truffles you or know wine just shitting, right. sit, uh, sitting on, on shelves you know um so yeah absolutely and it's like you know people don't realize in the you know th- they're starting to realize this now and um about the ramifications of the restaurant industry and what it really means to America and the rest of it but but our minds were racing that night and we're thinking okay cuz it's not just you it's 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 Thomas and Danielle. It's all and it's not just their restaurants here. 
There's a couple ones, you know, they got restaurants all over the world. And then we thought, I think, oh, wait. And then it's Wolf. And then it's Jean Georges. And then it's, and then we started thinking, and then your mind starts multiplying, right? You know, when you think of something, when, you, when something hits you, and then your mind goes, but, oh, but then this, uh, then this. And then, and then, so we started talking. It's like, wait, it's everybody we know. It's every restaurant. Wait, wait. It's every restaurant in America. And they're going to shut restaurants down. They're going to shut them down first. And now, if you shut restaurants down, people, you know, restaurants are, they're the largest, people don't really realize this, restaurants are the largest private sector employer in America. It, it employs 15.6 million people Damn. because it's so labor intensive, right? Just just in how restaurants are done. Restaurants contribute a trillion dollars to the economy. It's one of the largest private yeah. sectors, you know, in 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 the lar- in, in, in in the largest economy in yeah. the world. What four percent? G yeah GDP. Uh, yeah yeah. I mean it's it's gigantic. Yeah right. And and the other thing is, and if you look at the from a macro standpoint of the economy, you don't have any place anywhere that has lots of people gathering that doesn't have a restaurant. You have to, right? You got to have bathrooms. Yep. You got to have air. You got to have food in with lots of people. I mean, it's just a necessity, uh, you know? And, and so if you take out restaurants, what's the next domino to fall? Well, it's to take out the institution that the restaurant's in. So the, so the hotels or, or the convention centers or, you know, any place, you know, a ball stadium, a, a, any place that has lots of people, you shut restaurants down. You shut down the economy. Yeah, like that's the that's the linchpin. Where there are people, there are hungry people. Yeah, well, <laughs> they, yeah, hungry. Yeah. You got to eat. It's part right? of the, yeah. We have to it. eat. Yeah, right. Um, and 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 so what's happening? I think now is people are starting to focus on. Oh my God, you shut the re-. well. This dawned on us on March twelfth. You know, to Jerome and I as we're talking, and we thought, okay. Now, I know what the insurance companies are going to do. They're going to take their money, and they're going to run to Washington. And they're going to get on PR, and they're going to start saying, we don't cover anything. And they're going to misrepresent their policies. They're going to lie that all the policies have exclusions. They're going to lie that the policies don't apply. And these policies are 300, some of these are 300, 400 pages long. Mm. And, And they're difficult even for seasoned litigators to read. Okay. And so I know that the game, because I've seen it before, was always your first lie. And, you know, there's a, there's a saying that's often, Mark Twain um, uh, would often repeat it, and it's, uh, it's a saying that says uh, that, a, that a lie can make it halfway around the world before the truth can get its boots on. And that's true, <laughs> you know. In, in, in Why is that? Because um, because people don't dig deep, right? You know, you, you hear something. It takes energy to dig deep. Well, it, it takes information. Yeah. And if the information you're given at first, you know, your first impressions, the other, if the information you're given is one thing, you think that's the truth. Mm-hmm. So the industry, had I had seen them do this in Katrina and Sandy, all this for a decade and a half. They go out and they lie first. They have the machine. They got the microphone. They don't have this one microphone. They got microphones all over the place in lots of ways in Washington and other places. And they go out and they lie about what they cover. And they try to get the government. So what we decided to do that day and that night and that we worked that weekend is we put, we coalesced, we started calling all our buddies and all the chefs. We call Wolfgang, we call Jean George. Can, can you time stand this for us? So that, this was like, like the, March. so this happened, the party was on the 12th. Okay. So the 11th was when they, you know, the insurance industry made gotcha, it public, gotcha. okay, these rumors. On the 12th, we had the party. That that night, we said we got to start calling it. So the next day, Jerome and I that and that weekend, that was like a Thursday or Friday. That weekend, we called every restaurant tour we know. Now you take every restaurant, you know, just just these guys have got millions and millions yeah. of Twitter followers. So we started calling everybody, and then we started calling people that owned hotels and people that owned casinos and people that owned the the buildings, powerful people that their restaurants were in. And we said, you know what, we this is not this kind of fight that's about to happen is going to be the most significant. And it dawned on us that weekend; it's the most significant 
civil litigation battle in history because you're taking down the largest sector of the largest economy in the world and you're taking it down. And not only that, it's not just restaurants. It's every business in America. Mm. Every business in America has got a, that's that's a, that you know that uh, that has one of these policies. Yeah. So so it's not just restaurants. It's everybody in this boat. So this is and and it meant a lot to the insurance industry. And not just big organizations and small organizations, but both big and small. Big and small. Yeah. So, so you know, I mean, I I represent clients that have you know billions and billions of losses, and I got client and you know, I got I got a client's got two food trucks, mm-hmm. right? And and so it it. It, it affects everybody universally. Now, and, and so, now normally um, in these situations, I'm usually dealing, the disaster is usually focused on like one city or one town or the tri-state area in New York. And so the insurance industry can, can get the lie across the, because they're lying about a minority mm-hmm. and the majority don't know. The majority aren't looking at the policies. Yeah. It's the minority. They think, oh, these guys... Well, so I said to the guys, look, what we have to do is we have to, as quickly as we can, they've got the money, but we got the numbers. Mm-hmm. We got the numbers, all right? The, the restaurant industry is way bigger. It's way more people. If we can get the word out about what the truth is, if we can go to Washington together, and then if we could have a civil action, because there's a, it's a three-pronged approach that these carriers take is, you know, it's a, it's a three prong. It's it's PR, it's political, and it's civil action in the courts. I said we got to we got to do all three. We need an organization that that does all three. And we just said, you know what? This is big. It's the biggest thing that's ever happened. It is. You know, you're the biggest part of the economy. Um, you know, this is this is the biggest issue that's facing all of us. And we thought, okay, well, the acronym for you know what's what is big. St- Business Interruption Group, and that was it. And boom, that weekend we we formed it, and, and or slow, shortly thereafter, um, and thousands of restaurants and thousands of companies joined this nonprofit to get the word out that you got to look at the policies. Yeah. So just one thing I want to point out, and it's something that comes up often on the show, the most successful restaurateurs, one of the lessons I've learned by far interviewing these successful restaurateurs is that they come together. And I think that yeah. it's, it's this idea of collaboration, this idea that we're stronger together, the idea yeah. that if we share knowledge, we'll all be better because of it. And I think and I, it's you're seeing it again, and it's something that comes up time and time again with the leaders in our industry. They don't look at each other as competition. They yeah. look at each other as colleagues and and, you know, uh, people to go to war with, you know, yeah. and I, th- I think it's really important that we start looking at the other businesses in our community that way, because if we share, if we can make this happen on a small level locally in our own, in our own communities. If we come together and share knowledge and support one another, whether it's maybe a local law that's being passed or something mm-hmm. that might affect businesses, like the share information is so powerful. Is yeah. That? And I think, you know, and I've seen it cause I see the aftermath of disasters that sometimes, you know, in the aftermath of disasters, people have to come together, yeah. right? You know, we had to come together in 9-11. We had to come together, you know, in times of war, communities come together, unfortunately. And sometimes it's the only time they come together, right? Yeah. Um, is we come together with a common purpose. And when you do that, when you come together with a common purpose, you get things done. Yeah. Things happen. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you see this effect after and I see it visually because I'm I'm effectively in war zones that I'm in and then, and then I see the communities afterwards and when the communities do come together you see a resurgence so there, there's a I don't say a silver lining because you can't you know, but there are things that will bounce like New Orleans after Katrina if you look at the culinary rebirth of this city which already which already was a gold standard, yeah. right, in America. Um, there was more restaurants that came back and more stuff. So when people dig deep on things that they're passionate about, now the problem, though, is that often you have large communities that are fragmented. That And, and look, we can, we can make the analogy of other things that are going on in America right now, that when you're fragmented and you don't have the common purpose or the message is is messed up either intentionally or just because people aren't focusing, then you don't get things done. Now, the restaurant industry has an opportunity not only now to save itself 
with this business interruption stuff. But it has the opportunity, a rare one, independent restaurants to come together because the voice and I, in speaking to the chefs and speaking to so many restaurateurs around America, um, everybody's going, you know, people, because people, the spotlight's on the restaurant industry. People take restaurants for, for, for granted. Yeah. You know, they, it, it, we go, we eat. And, and then now that that's not happening with social distancing and the rest of it, we're feeling a withdrawal. I mean, every time people come together for anything, there's food. Yeah. And, and, and that's there's a you know those that are that love the restaurant industry and appreciate it get that right yeah. that that people want to be people want to be chefs they want to be restaurant owners because man that's where people come like yeah. that's where people gather you know it's it's not a place generally you go to make money it's a place you go because you're passionate about nurturing a community yes right and so the, hopefully, that's hopefully, why hopefully, yeah. that's how you're coming. Uh, there's other reasons why you're coming, yeah. but um, but but that that I think you know, if the restaurant industry as a whole comes together, I mean, it's unbelievably powerful. Like, just take our organization. We started on the t- on in, in the middle of March. By March 29th, the Business Interruption Group, the President of the United States called us. Mm. Okay, in the middle, forget what you think about the president, okay? But the president of the United States, in the middle of one of the most catastrophic things in the last 100 years, called us and seven of us and spoke to us on the phone privately with about the restaurant industry and about the insurance companies denying these things and how important it was. I mean, think about that. That didn't just happen be, for any other other than that we got the word that, look, the restaurant industry is the largest private sector employer. We're going to be affected the most. And that was the that power after that phone call, the chef we, we were talking, all the chefs and I were talking, going, Wow, you know, it's like and it didn't matter if you were a Democrat or Republican or you liked them or you didn't like them. Um, but the, the the power, the awesome power of we started an organization, the president of the United States called us and two weeks later. Two weeks later? Yeah. Like the like, power of coming together. The power of coming together. Yeah. And so that's a lesson that if the voice is now the restaurant industry needs, you know, I've also seen, you know, some, you see flaws in the system. A lot of times you have restaurant, you have industry coalitions that get put together and they get funded by big corporations or, you know, big monsters, not the, what you would associate with independent restaurants. Okay. Yeah. And sometimes those organizations get to where they're not too responsive to the masses. Yeah. I mean, we can make analogies in lots of ways. Uh, and and I think what's coming out of this is the restaurant industry going and saying, we do have a voice, mm-hmm. and we can bring people together. If we come together. If we come together. I mean, I, and I've seen this for, you know, with my buddies, my friends, um, who, are, you know, were outstanding uh, in, in so many ways of what they've done. Uh, but I've seen it, like, those... A chef of that caliber can almost get anybody on the phone. Yeah. I mean, almost anybody they could call because people love chefs. They love absolutely going in and they have and influence. They have incredible. I mean, and it doesn't. They have influence. You know, and I see this in business. Like I'm in. I'm an entrepreneur. I'm just a lawyer, and I see it. And sometimes, you know, I, I've seen a billionaires in. Like I, I got lots of partners that are billionaires and and friends and different things. And I've seen the influence of a billionaire and seeing what that can do. But I got to tell you, you, I take a celebrity chef can get on the phone more than an average billionaire because sometimes people don't like that guy or they don't like that industry. Everybody loves to. Yeah. I mean, famous chefs got millions and millions and millions of followers. Celebrities, everybody. I mean, you call a chef, you know, um, you know, they they will return that call, you know, of, of these guys. And that kind of influence can be harnessed for good. Yeah. It's, it can be hundred percent. It's social capital, you know, right. and I think money is one thing. Right, it's capital, but that's it, right. Relationships, there's no being the value in that. There's well, no you, beating it. You, you, you know, I spend a lot of time now because the businesses that I'm in at the level, you know, I spend a lot of time in Washington and politics because you have to be, you know, at a certain level of business or, or when you're dealing with big macro markets, you have to be because that affects laws affects macro markets. Uh, but I'll tell you what, you know, and and I I've had I've had I've had people go, well, how are you going to fight? Like, how are you going to fight that giant? You can't fight the insurance industry. If they come together, they got all, they got a trillion dollars to fight you. How are you going to fight them? 
I'm like, look, because they're going to go to Washington and they're going to. I said, listen, insurance industry don't vote. They don't vote. Yeah. Okay. Who votes? People vote. 15.6. I'll take 15.6 million people. Yeah. Versus all the money in the world. That That's a truly no, no amount of money. Because what do politicians want to be responsible for? What are leaders that make laws? They want to be responsible to the people who are going to get them reelected. Okay. Yeah. And, and that matter to the economy. And so you can level the playing field if you come together. You yes. really can. Yeah. And one thing I'm curious about, how many, what percentage of businesses do you think got business interruption insurance? Is it a majority, minority? It, it, you know, it's a hard number to say because a lot of the numbers from the industry, there's only one industry that knows it. Yeah, and that's correct. the insurers, yeah. right? They're so, not that information well, the in, yeah, they're being really vague, and and how they 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 throw the numbers out to Washington. There's always an, you know, they're always either underplaying a number or exaggerating it, depend on what's in their best interest, exactly. right? But for by and large, I think the common number is about a third of businesses in America um, bought business interruption coverage, but. And so you think, okay, well, it's a, just a minority of people versus a large minority. A third is third of all, a third of the largest economy on earth, is <laughs> you know, is yeah. a lot. Yeah. But if you look at it from the standpoint of who it affects, like as a in part of the economy and the people, if you were a business that has lots of employees, the chances are you had a higher degree of chances of having the coverage. Why? Because a, a business that has lots of employees, like a restaurant, it can't afford to just shut. It's not like a factory. It's not like yeah. a widget factory. You just go, okay, I'm going to shut the lights off today. The machines will stop. And then when I'm ready, I'll just put the print and press up again. That's not how restaurants work. No. You can't just go, Stop. I mean, you got all the. What are your employees going to do? Yeah. And then your employees are going to scatter. We saw this in Katrina. Yeah. And they leave, right? Then you have to, the energy and money you have to put back into oh. training new employees. Yeah. Like that in itself is worth across the boards millions of dollars. Right. And, and then, and, you know, in, in, in a certain way, it starts to focus where focus should be, which is on the fact that businesses, especially ones that are labor intensive, like, like, like restaurants, the employees are important. I got to tell you, after Katrina, we had a uh, to try to find bus boys to try to find people that did dishes to try to back the line people. We started to realize these are incredibly important people. The machine doesn't work without those yeah. people, and and being trained as a group and whatnot. And you know, uh, in Katrina, you know, all those people scattered and they got other jobs. They became carpenters. They worked on rebuilding, and then they didn't come back. And you know, you could be the greatest chef. You know, you could be a great chef, but if you don't have people to help you pull that night off. You can't do it. You can't do it alone. You yeah. can't do it alone, yeah. right? And so you start to focus on the importance there. But going back, if you look at the statistics of business interruption coverage, who it affects, if you were a business that had lots of employees, generally you got sold the business interruption coverage. Yeah. And it was only as expensive as what your income is because it's graded on how much your income. So a small business could afford it mm -hmm. or a larger business could afford it. It's all proportion on your business um, because it's covering just the amount of your revenue. Uh, it's just taking a percentage of your revenue. And so it was sold to a lot of people that had lots of employees. So if you're America, if you're, a, so I say, if you're a worker in America, chances are your employers got it. Mm -hmm. So, so, so that's him. That's why it's so critical. Um, and now, what, what the industry's facing, they're starting to realize these government programs aren't. You know, they're, they're never. I've been involved in every single one of these bailout programs, and they never work like they should because they're they're thrown together. Um, and in the and generally, businesses or companies or people, they survive or not, depending on whether their coverage pay, it go, pays out eventually. Um, and in this situation. In the absence of it, I've seen statistics that are, man, they're scary. Like, like, like four out. I mean, the James Beard Foundation, which joined our group, um, estimates four to five restaurants are going going yeah, bust. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. Well, one thing I'm curious about. The reason why I asked about how many restaurants actually have business interruption service because, uh, I mean, you said we we're responsible for what a trillion dollars, yeah. right? Um, how much money is in the the bank? 
these insurance like how much money do they how much bankroll do they have you said somewhere you, you had a number yeah well they throw out the number it's interesting because one of the defenses that the insurance industry it's it's just a it's a crazy one when you think about it um but the their reasons for not paying is we can't afford it well, that's what I'm curious about. Can like what happens? Yeah. So like yeah, it's bullshit. Like well, it's total. It's total. And I don't know if I can swear on here, but it's complete. No, you can say way worse it's than complete that. and other horseshit. Okay, <laughs> yeah. that they don't have enough money because here's the thing: the way insurance works, and and they're they're lying to the public because they're going, oh, we could never afford this. If if you if you make us pay these policies, we'll go bankrupt. And you know, the first reaction is. I'm sorry, but fuck you. I mean, I'm going bankrupt. Yeah. Like, like, wait, why should you? I didn't expect the pandemic. You didn't expect the pandemic. We all didn't expect it. And so I, you shouldn't have to pay me what you owe me, and I've been paying all because you're worried you can't pay your rent. I can't pay my rent. Yeah. Okay, and the, and the idea that whether or not you owe something depends upon whether you can pay. I mean, ask any restaurateur whether their landholder, you know, leaseholder, you know, is going, no, Pay me, you know, or, or let's work something out. Um, the insurance industry isn't doing that. Now, the idea that they don't have enough money is is just bullshit because what's happening, when you sell insur- when they sell you an insurance policy, like if I sell you an insurance policy and I'm an insurance company, um, I then go have a risk to you. I have a liability to you. Well, guess what do people do that have a liability? They buy insurance. So when I sell you insurance, I then go buy insurance on my potential liability to you. And those companies buy insurance on the it's called reinsurance. Yeah. So there's trillions upon trillions of dollars of insurance of 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 insurance coverage on the on, on these policies. And there's assets all through dispersed all through the economy. Okay. To cover this stuff. And so the 822 billion is cash. Yeah. I mean, you like look, it's just cash they have in the bank. Yes, yeah, so you look at that eight hundred million or billion, um, and you think to, like because I know with PPP it was a few hundred billion dollars. So we went, th- we burned through that, and it felt like a couple weeks. You know, people mm-hmm. burned through that. So like, how long would it take to burn through eight hundred billion? Yeah, I, you know, and it's it's look the coverage, the insurance coverage. Um, no, first off, but first off, the 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 idea that the insurance companies would go, that the insurance industry would go and solve it is complete lie. It's a total lie because the solvency isn't just the cash. It's like you. You're, it's not the cash you have in the bank isn't what you can pay. It it's your assets and your other things that, that you've got and your insurance, yeah. right? And so they have insurance for it. So and then those companies have insurance for gotcha. it. So the risk is dispersed so they can afford it. Um, but policies, they don't just pay you it's not like a jackpot thing. They pay you just that's the good thing about insurance, especially why business interruption coverage will work, is business interruption coverage, unlike PPP, you know, PPP was burned out and the rest of us, but we're hearing stories where there's companies that got it that didn't need it, and then there's companies that didn't get anything that needed it. The thing about insurance is much more efficient because it measures, it pre-measures. You you already made a deal mm-hmm. as to how much exactly you would need to survive during a civil authority shutdown. The like, agreement's already been made. Yeah, and it and your and your business has been measured mm-hmm. as to how much you need exactly in the policy, and that's what you base your policy premiums on. So the efficiency of paying BI coverage. If they had just paid the policies, everybody would be okay, and and people wouldn't be on unemployment lines, and 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 we would have things that are factored into the economy. You know, businesses aren't going to go if we don't. It's going to be cheaper if we pay the coverage, and and we're not handy because the alternative is we're going to handle the biggest dispute ever to lawyers, mm. and those lawyers like me are going to fight over this stuff. For three to five years, you know, in this instance, it's it's really personal, especially for me, because I know what's going to happen if we don't find a solution, and if the carriers don't do the right thing, I'm going to be litigating over the ashes of my best friend's businesses. Yeah, I want to wrap up just kind of letting the listeners know, like, what can we do? Like, what what are the calls to action that we can do in our own businesses to protect ourselves and to protect the industry and to make real change within just our, our the, the system that 
it surrounds us basically the, the 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 legal system or whether it's just the better insurance system who knows like like what what needs to change is kind of the, the question so. yeah so well the first thing is you know look spotting the problem and recognize the problem is the first thing yeah. right as to what the issues are and and but then you know complain about it or just having a movement doesn't work if it's uh, too obtuse like you got to have a very narrow focused solution and we've got one with the business interruption group um so th the first thing that we're doing is is it's an outreach because the first thing people need to do is to is to get the word out there that you got to look at the policies like oh, the policies are different man they don't all, some exclude it some don't so you got to look at the policies there's about half of the larger policies at least have no exclusions and they apply to this they really do so you got to look now you may have one that's got an exclusion in it and there's going to be battles as to whether does the exclusion have to do with a virus in your kitchen does that does that affect your 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 civil authority coverage there's going to be battles all over the place the first thing people need to do is um they really need to consult the professional um, is is because these policies are hard to read and you got to get somebody to look at it. That's the first thing that you do. Don't trust your agent or your broker or the insurance company to tell you you don't have coverage. They're telling everybody they don't have coverage, and that's a lie. Okay. That's number one, so to look at it. Number two, um, I would say you need to, uh, that I, I would say to support this movement that we've got um, because we're going to have a solution to people that have that have exclusions and people that don't. Everybody that's got it. So I would say go to the website, uh, the Business Interruption Group website, and I'll give it to you. It's, it's uh, W E letter R B I G dot org. We are big dot org. Go there. It's a petition. Sign up. It's not asking for any, it's a nonprofit, but it's not asking for any money or donations or commitment. It's just signing on to it, saying, I'm part of the industry. This is wrong. Insurance companies should do the right thing. That's all it is. And and if you have no exclusions, you should pay it. If you do have an exclusion, the Business Interruption Group um, has just uh, helped with a bill that's being introduced today. Nice. By Mike Thompson of California. And this will be a bill that will allow the insurance companies, even if they have a defense, they can pay the policy and receive reimbursement from the government. So if this bill gets passed, every policy will likely be funded. Now, if it doesn't have an exclusion, the insurance companies pay. If it does have an exclusion for the civil authority because the government shut it down, the, government's, the government helps pay that and provides a subsidy. So if this bill is passed, every business in America that has business interruption coverage and every employee that's dependent upon that will be saved. So I would go to that website, and we, we were going to give outreach and stuff about that bill and stuff. So go there. That's, I think, the biggest, most important thing. Now, if you don't have an exclusion in your policy, if the word virus does not appear in your policy, the word pandemic does not appear in your policy, you have coverage. Okay? And, and I mean, you've got coverage, and in, 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 um, in you know, absent some clear exclusion. And the court is going to be a, you know, I'm hoping there's going to be some kind of coming together with this bill. If this bill gets passed, we're going to save three to five years of litigation. Is there a, com is there a critical number you need to hit um, with that, that the signing up to say that I have a business, or is is there a number we can hit to make that I mean, look, way better? Or? Look, the more I'll tell you this: the insurance industry is watching that site. Like, like they literally they launched a nearly identical site like in color and everything yeah. nearly to, 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 to fence against it because we're getting the truth out there. If the industry, if politicians in Washington see that the restaurant industry is coming together or that the business community is coming together, that's who they represent. Mm -hmm. That's who they represent. And, and the more people that are on that, that are speaking the truth, you know, sunshine, they say, is the best disinfectant. You know, we got a virus of lies here, and and the more people that are there, that the voices are heard, this is going to happen. I've seen it. You know, I look. I've made a career at a punching above my weight class, right? Um, but but this this can happen. But you know, I would say go to that website. It's the biggest thing they can do. We're spreading information. Um, I would say if you've got a lawyer, the lawyer can go on the website and get information from our groups because. The Business Interruption Group is actually helping pro bono other lawyers 
who are do who are doing this or other people's lawyers. So it's not a, you know, this is not a catch all to come to hire John Hotailing or his law firm. It's to go out there and, and to do a petition of this group and uh, and this can work. Yeah. So I mean, a lot of people listening to this might not have the the capital to invest in a lawyer. Would you say that this is something like a legal Zoom could handle? If, like as far as just reading contracts and saying like, is are we good or? Well, there's there's some bandwidth in the business interruption group to do that for them, okay. right? So so and then there's a lot of lawyers that will do this on a contingency fee. So you don't need they'll take the risk. Okay. They, like they'll front the legal expenses and take the risk and and you can do it on a contingency fee. Um, and you know, we can refer you or the business interruption group can refer you or we can look at it, but, but the, the, you can find lawyers to do it. Okay. okay. You want to find, make sure you get one that specializes in this stuff, but most lawyers will do it. They will co- do a complimentary review of your business interruption policy and tell you whether or not you have a claim. And if you have a lawyer that's, that you like, but that's not a, inefficient, that, that doesn't do this for a living then you can have them join the business interruption group and we can give that lawyer information on how to do it. Beautiful. Awesome. And again, that website is we are big. That's W E R B I G dot org. Uh, we'll link to that in the show notes. Make sure you stick around for the closing thoughts. I'll, I'll let you know what show, what episode number this is. Uh, so you can jump right over there and click if you can't remember the, the website, but uh, anything we have not discussed up to this point that you were hoping to bring to the table, we just didn't get out. Yeah, no, I think I think you re- you really covered it, and I think the takeaway the takeaway from this um, should be that look, this is this is survival, you know, for for mo- for, for 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 most restaurants. The determination of this will be for survival, whether they survive or not. Um, not to give up, you know. We started the show that way, is to say you don't give up. That's the first thing. You don't, you, you know, and, and there is, and the other thing, there is a path. There is a, p- a path out of here, mm-hmm. uh, but we got to we got to take the journey together. Yeah, and I want to respect your time. It's we're almost at the end of our time. Yep. But there's one thing I heard you say in another interview that you did, where you said the fundamental issue with our system, our insurance system, is that we're giving all of our money to the people that make the decision. Yeah, and like that's a fundamental broken system. What do we do to change that? Yeah, that that's the biggest troubling. You know, when I give speeches about insurance to, to groups, and I, I do this to nonprofits and business groups and everything, I do a big chart where I show graphically all of the money going into a funnel, and the funnel goes to the lobbyist and the lawyer and the, and the adjuster and everything. And all of that army is, pay, is, is professional, professional organizations to put up a wall for you ever getting that money again. And that has become our si- our system and it is broke. You know, it's very very much broken and because they're adverse to you. But but we get all this advertisement that lies to us says no no they're going to be on our side. They're not on our side because I'm not on their side. You know, I'm on one side, they're on another. You need to have a balance. The only way it works is we would have to change, and this is this is more getting into insurance commissioners and other things, and it's a big change. But there has to be the policy premiums have to be able to provide uh, coverage for somebody who's a professional on your side. Like that's you need to call a claims department that's not adverse to you, that's funded, yeah. that's on your side. Now, if you're a big, and this is the crazy part, if you are a big corporation, like if you're one of my clients, that's a Fortune 100 company that's my client, when I read their policy, their policy puts in a claim expense. But for everyday people, you know, so so they can go hire the people yeah. on their side because you got to have people on both sides, right? It wouldn't be fair for the policyholder to be the person that decides how much they get yeah. alone, nor is it f- fair for the other side. There's got to be a balance. It, means that, it almost sounds like there needs to be a third entity that's like a, like a, a neutral. No, 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 there's no, because there's, yeah, Cause I I mean, like that, the, well, that's a judge, right? Yeah. But, but the reality is you need people on both sides, right? You can't have, if you have a third party who's a judge, and you only have lawyers on one side or professionals on one side, then the yeah. evidence is going to get skewed. Yeah. Right? You need you need pros that put this together for a living. Unfortunately, in 99% of the cases, people re- allow the experts on the other side to make the decision. Okay. And that's the problem. So what can we do to influence a change? I know you mentioned voting earlier. Like who uh, or what do we I vote mean, for? I think I think that you got to and this uh I try to find this, you know, a disclaimer because this is a 
you know, this is, I have a conflict in saying this because this is what I do for a living, but, but you need to have somebody on your side that does this, right? You, you need to, whenever you make a claim for your insurance company, you can't rely upon them doing it. You got to have somebody on your side. Now, if you do it before you're turned down, you can hire somebody like at 10% of contingency fee, not much, and they can move the needle for you. Okay. It's like an adjuster or you getting a lawyer to do this on your. This is going to be a more difficult situation because it's such a titanic battle. They've already denied everything, but you can still find. So the idea is you got to get somebody who is doing this on your side before there's a problem. Okay. Got yeah. you, got you. Yeah. Man. I want to respect your time, so we got to yeah. wrap it up. But uh, this is a tradition here at Restaurant Unstoppable. Uh, we wrap up by having my guests call somebody out. And I know you have a deep network within the restaurant industry, but who's one or two or three people that you respect yeah. and admire and believe would make a great guest mentor like you made for Well, us I, I got I to gotta tell you, well, well, well you know, one of, the, one of the people that have really led the charge in this whole industry, um, which is the you know, arguably the most celebrated chef in all of America is Thomas Keller. I mean, he's, he's, he's a wonderful, he he is a wonderful guy. I just, uh, uh, I just want to thank him for, you know, his leadership and, and what all the chefs and stuff have done their leaderships in here. But, but the, the list of the leaders in the insurance, I mean, I mean, in the, um, in the restaurant industry, uh, is just so long of people that have chipped in. I mean, Tom Colicchio and Danny Myers and 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 Jose Andreas and who started the uh, the Independent Restaurant Coalition. And th- there's just so many leaders. You really have had people step up in the restaurant industry. You know, people that you th- you know a lot of restaurant. I've seen restaurant tours think, okay, they're in an ivory tower. You know, they're in a three star Michelin chef. What do they have to do with uh, me? I will tell you firsthand. Those chefs, those guys feel it. Mm. They feel it for the industry. They feel it for the little guy, and they have been spending their time donating it. And, and, and they were all there. And, and every they they have gone out on a limb. They've taken criticism. I mean, you know, Thomas, Danielle, Wolfgang, John, George, they got a lot of flack for speaking to President Trump. You know, and then for people who are you know who don't care to have a different politics, and you were going, no, guys, look. He's speaking for you, right? He's speaking for all of us. These guys are going out and taking a risk. Um, they'll be okay. They will survive, but they understand their industry doesn't. And so I would say that if you are a, you know, if you are uh, somebody, anybody in the industry, and it doesn't matter where you are, because I recognize how much everybody's level of contribution is, you got to thank those guys because they're out there fighting for you. Awesome. And uh, look out, guys. I'm coming after you. I'd love to get you all, everybody that uh, John just mentioned, I'd love to get you all on the show. You all have an open invitation. And again, the call to action go to we uh, are, that's lo- the letter R, big.org. Sorry, oh. we are big.org. Again, thank you so much for coming awesome. on the show. It is 12 29, so you got to okay. get going. Thank I gotta you. Go. And uh, we'll call it there. Thanks, um, There is no question you are unstoppable. Great. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed today's video, please like, share, subscribe, and hit that bell icon. And don't forget, there is a complete archive of every episode at restaurantunstoppable.com. Peace.